getting out there, opening up my ideas, let people challenge them, and then keep on thriving on uncertainty. Once if you get too satisfied or too settled or too proud, then maybe you can lose your ability to really evolve. This is the Creative Voyage Podcast, a long-form interview show with the mission to help creative professionals level up. I'm your host, Mario De Picolzwan. I'm a creative professional myself, active in the fields of graphic design, art direction, and creative consulting, working with companies such as Kinfolk, Menu, and Sonos. Through season one of this podcast, I present in-depth interviews with some of the world's most inspiring creative professionals, revealing the stories that shape their lives and careers, plus actionable strategies to help you take your mindset and skills to the next level. I invite you to join me on this journey. This episode is devoted to the co-founder of one of my favorite architecture and design studios. I am Jonas Bjarpolsen. I am co-founder and partner in an architectural studio in Copenhagen called Norm Architects. We work within different creative disciplines. So we do residential architecture, commercial interiors like restaurants, hotels, creative office spaces. And then we work a lot with uh, product design, photography, and art direction. We have our studio in, in the old center of, of Copenhagen, but we work internationally in most of Europe, in the US, and in, in Japan. Norm Architects have worked with clients such as N Tradition, Wallpaper Magazine, Reform, Kinfolk, Paper Collective, Menu, The Office Group, and Sticks and Sushi, just to name a few. I've been a fan of their work for a long time, and I've also had a pleasure of collaborating with Jonas on a few different occasions. So it was a fantastic opportunity to be able to connect with him in this context as well. In this final episode of the season one of the podcast, we're going to listen to the highlights of the conversation I had with Jonas in person in my apartment in Copenhagen in October of 2018. We cover topics such as positioning as a creative, how Jonas approaches new projects, his advice to young professionals, main challenges of being an architect today, his work routines, the importance of following your passion, and much more. How Jonas developed as a creative professional can at least partly be linked to his upbringing. On one side, his mother was artistic and encouraged creativity in their household. And on the other, his father was analytical, business-oriented, and worked as an accountant. Partly to keep the family tradition, Jonas started studying business. But after one year, he found himself reconsidering that choice and decided to take a break year. He moved to Rome to his relatives, where he wandered the streets, absorbing the life around him and spent time working in a painter's studio, immersing himself in art, philosophy and architecture. At the time, Jonas was considering becoming a painter, but after self-evaluating his work, he concluded that might not be the best choice. Back in Copenhagen, he gradually started working with his current professional partner, Kasper Lodzbeck, who was already enrolled in architecture school, and shortly after, Jonas joined as well. However, he hasn't abandoned business school, partly due to his nature of not giving up on things, so he studied both business and architecture, alternating them every year and finishing both at the same time. Even though he liked business and he still uses those skills, for example in strategic design development and consulting, during that time he realized he enjoyed creative profession more and that set him off on his career path. That formative part of his life seems quite intense and naturally Jonas was readjusting his focus as he went along. So I decided to start a conversation asking him what would he advise his younger self at the start of his career. I think there are a lot of advices I could give myself uh, both in life and in terms of my professional career. I also think I kind of uh, considered a lot along the way. I don't feel that I made any choices that I today regret or wish I, I had to done differently. But I think, you know, I would go back and, and tell myself to really, you know, follow my passion in many ways that I shouldn't make any career decisions based on ambition or strategy, but, you know, really spend time doing what you love. And then I think if you do that and spend a lot of hours really becoming good at something that you really like, I think, you know, success in some form will follow automatically. You don't have to be that conscious about where you're going. You know, when you kind of read, kind of help yourself books or whatever you call it, it's always about setting goals and reaching the goals yeah. and finding a path and then follow it. For me, I think it's much better actually finding a process that you like and then follow the process and see that where it takes you. It's not about being naive or make uh, choices, but, you know, kind of live in a good way with uh, uncertainty. I think that keeps you on your toes and bring you in, in good places if you really work hard for it. Yeah, exactly. And I guess if you're, you also have this like an analytical background, 
for you, it probably makes sense that you kind of need to offset that more with kind of leaning towards. Yeah, yeah. For this yeah. to find, let's say, like a, a balance in a way. It's always about balance. Yeah. I mean, if you only follow your passion, then you know you see a lot of people ending up in in bad yeah, places. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because they're not reasonable. I mean, it's too much. And you also see creatives or artists that you know have just been too passionate about the things, and then of course it has a price when it comes to family or your surroundings or collaborators and yeah, yeah. or your health yeah, or, yeah, uh, yeah. and your mm -hmm. health that's definitely something you need yeah. to consider as well so of course it's all about balance but i kind of uh, go back and advise myself to lean more against doing all the things that makes you happy in, uh, in life and then try to to downplay all the things that you should do and kind of uh, ignore the pressure maybe of your surroundings whether it's uh, colleagues uh, fellow students or parents or society in general i think uh, you should kind of uh, follow your inner urge or your inner vocation following up on my first question i've asked jonas what advice he would give a young person entering into this kind of work in school for example you learn how to learn in many ways so it's much about thinking learning how to think how to structure your thoughts and how to be creative in many ways but you don't really get experience that's in many cases my impression so i would say to, to younger creators it's a good thing to find kindred spirits to find people that you can work with and learn from really to gain that experience and of course you can still work with your own things but i think a lot of creatives whether it has to do with kind of insecurity or ego or protecting their ideas a lot of people that likes to work very much in solitude to kind of have a, a close process of creating something and then bringing out the final result to the world i like much better the idea of kind of opening up your process processes and your thoughts and collaborating i think in general with people that are like-minded and it's so easy today i think to find globally people that are, are like-minded that can share your uh, views on the world or your preferences and aesthetics or uh, your approach to design and architecture in general and i think it's a really good idea to kind of uh, seek out those people and to just approach them and i mean there doesn't need to be any specific goal in mind or any kind of thought about why you should meet but just meet them and if you open up your, all your ideas and your own creative processes and try to give something to those person that appeal to you it often seems to me there are greater results coming out of that instead of working individually with your own ideas i kind of see that with a lot of younger creatives and studios that it's more accepted to collaborate and reach out and do projects together and also across borders of different disciplines so i mean maybe i very fascinated with a certain artist or a musician or a graphic designer a photographer and i want to learn more about that i get a lot out of reaching out to people in general and starting up just conversations a project and kind of uh, also opening up my own ideas and work in collaboration with that i think that could be a good advice for anybody starting out do you do that often you actually just like being like cold emailing or cold calling like people you like yeah it's i don't know if often it's, it's not that i do it every day but uh, yeah i think i really thrive from meeting uh, new people and you know working so many disciplines kind of always changing path traveling a lot working with a lot of different companies a lot of different creatives i do that all the time and if there's a person that i really like i, I just reach out and say should we meet or should we do something together or i have this specific idea i would love uh, for you to do it or work to on this project and uh, could that be a possibility and you know sometimes you're declined and other times you know it, it just uh, works out really well and i mean you shouldn't be afraid of the uncertainty or or the possible negative response i mean i think in general you gain much more energy from working in that way than kind of being afraid of either sharing your ideas or reaching out as a creative professional in many ways jonas seems to be out of this world it can be mind-boggling to understand how he does all that he does. Architecture, photography, strategy, design. At the same time, he's generous, kind and down-to-earth. As I've mentioned in the intro, I work with Jonas on some projects, and I've experienced firsthand his focus and apparent ease with which he solves creative tasks. But still, how he managed to do that remained mostly a mystery. That's why, with the goal of perhaps partially demystifying his process, I've used this opportunity to ask him how his days and work habits look like. 
it does change a lot. So some weeks I'm traveling to different countries. In the same week, it's a lot about meeting new people or presenting ideas or working at a factory with craftspeople or overseeing a site or meeting with clients, interviewing them about their needs. Mm -hmm. Or other weeks I can be in meetings from Monday to Friday afternoon discussing <laughs> new projects or strategy. And, and other weeks, again, I can be at home working, drawing kind of shutting the world out completely. And then, you know, other weeks can be a mixture of, of those things. I think I have a certain ability to kind of shut out the rest of the world and focus deeply on one thing at a time. When I was starting out school, I had a tendency to, you know, just sit with my mouth open and stare out the window, thinking about other things and what was happening in the in the classroom. And the teachers at that time, you know, they approached my parents because they thought I might be retarded in some way. But I still have a kind of that ability to, you know, I can sit in a train station filled with people and be deeply concentrated about work. As you said, when we're photographing, I'm so much into creating images that I can have, you know, 20 people around me doing things. I'm not aware about what's going on around me. I'm just focused on my work. So I think I have a tendency to whatever I'm doing right here, right now, I dig, you know, deeply into that. And then I kind of cut off all other things, which also means that, you know, I can have days where I work very creatively, where I have like uh, hundreds of emails ticking in. I have people calling me all the time, but I close my computer, I shut off my phone and it doesn't stress me. You know, those things need to wait. Yeah. So I, I really need to kind of shut out the world and focus on one thing at a time. So even though, as you said, I might have a hundred different projects going on at the same time. For me, it's not that much about juggling balls it's taking one thing at a time i think and that's the way i manage it in, in many ways you do have a lot of things going on you must have a certain like system to keep yourself on track because like if you like zoom in in one thing you probably have to know like what's next so do you have like assistant like or do you kind of manage it yourself i'm really bad at delegating uh, work to others uh, so i don't think i could work with an assistant and i'm pretty unstructured also but i think in many ways my passion for the different projects drives me so it's not kind of like i turn on and off i can't kind of shut off my work and do something so the different projects they're kind of driving me all by them themselves i kind of know what are the next steps and and what i need to do and then as i said if there are things that are not that important or that doesn't preoccupy me that much at a certain time they'll have to wait a little bit in line so it's kind of like it's not a formal structure but it's my brain structuring uh, things for me very much driven by passion i think very annoying for other people sometimes <laughs> yeah, like, yeah i can imagine both <laughs> friends and uh, and family and their uh, <laughs> colleagues and partners and clients and collaborators uh, <laughs> but uh, that's how it is so you said that even as a child you were able to focus so was it just like a natural like innate quality you have yeah i think it's something that's part of me in, in many ways but i've also been thinking about it uh, over the years, reflected upon it. It has also at certain times caused problems, but I see it as a positive quality now and I try to make it a virtue in many ways. Because uh, I think it's, if you have many projects and you can easily get stressed, there are so many people getting stressed today because they want to do so much and there are so many possibilities and, you know, people offer potential really great projects all the time. And if you are to accept a lot of these possibilities and kind of dive into all these projects, you need to have kind of routines that will keep you away from, yeah. from stress. And as you say, otherwise it can kind of ruin your health. And all the things that were supposed to be enjoyable and fun, and they end up just being stressful and it's not about enjoying the process anymore, then it's about getting the things done and moving on to the next target all the time. And if you do that for too long, suddenly you realize that, hey, life kind of disappeared. I was just focusing on goals and I didn't really enjoy all the supposedly enjoyable processes. And I mean, as I said before, I chose to work creatively because it made me happy. I wanted that life for myself. But if I end up kind of just making it a long list I need to tick off instead of kind of enjoying what I do every day, then I, I failed in many ways. So I think that's super important. And would you be willing to expand or like talk? How much do you work? Like, because I know like some people, like, like some friends, like I have so many questions. How does he do all these things? He's like working all the time. You know, sometimes when I'm too busy, because I also do get stressed sometimes. 
I wonder why couldn't I just organize myself in a way that it would be kind of a more nine to five job and I would be relaxed and I would have more time to do sports and be with the family and kind of balance out work and your private life better. But I don't think that's the answer for me. I think it's more about really working very intensively in periods and then other periods kind of uh, pulling the plug and doing nothing. So this week, for example, it started for me 5.30 Sunday morning, early kind of cheating, uh, going into the week. And when I reached Tuesday morning, I had already worked 37 hours, so like a full week. So oh. <laughs> not much sleep, a lot of work. But then I have periods, for example, two times a year, I travel and I shut off the phone. I don't bring my computer and then I don't work at all. So then it's all about kind of relaxing, maintaining myself, doing sports, being with my family and really being present in those periods. Yeah. And then of course there are periods of the year where it's more balanced out, but I kind of enjoy that it's kind of being very intensive at, mm -hmm. at times and then very relaxed at other times. Yeah. And I think something I realized when I started out working for myself 10 years ago is that work doesn't feel like work anymore. It's life for me. So it's a, you know, a lot of people, they have a certain mood or a feeling in their body when it's weekdays and another feeling when they reach Friday and they have weekends. Literally, I haven't had that kind of distinction or feeling in my body or uh, between what is work days and what is weekends or what is work and what's uh, kind of life. So yeah. that whole idea of work-life balance, I think when you really do things that are pleasurable, that I enjoy that I would do, even though people didn't pay me money for it, yeah. then it's <laughs> just life, all of it. And then it's not that hard and yeah. it's not that stressful. It's just, yeah. it gives you energy. It doesn't drain you. Yeah. That is like reoccurring like topic with like a few people that I talked about is more about yeah, kind of integrating both. It's just like, as you said, it's life. It's probably very different for different people. Everybody has different tempers and uh, yeah. different priorities and different values in life. But I think it really works well for me. But it also means I need to be very cautious about not accepting too many projects that takes me in a different direction. Yeah. So both for myself and for the studio, I'm very careful about what type of projects we do. I mean, you can easily kind of go on in a wrong direction. If you do one project successfully then people come and ask you for the same type of project. Yeah. So, and I, if I accept something, I want to do it well. So even though it's not the kind of my dream project, I will try to do it well. And if I do that too many times, then people will come and ask me for the same thing. And then if you're not conscious about it, then suddenly you end up doing something you don't like. So you kind of need to evaluate all the time. Was this, you know, a pleasurable proce process uh, along the way? I mean, I like the result, but was the process also nice? okay, then I can do it again or I can do something similar. If it wasn't nice, then maybe you need to kind of take that project out of your portfolio and say no the next time somebody come and ask you. We live in complex, disruptive times. And in many ways, we are witnessing most industries, including the creative ones, being restructured, which can bring struggles to those involved in them. However, by identifying the problems, we can attempt to tackle them. I've asked Jonas to share what he thinks are the main challenges of being an architect working today. I think there are tons of challenges. I think for us at least a big challenge is that, you know, due to social media, kind of communicating with the whole world is much easier, which also means that a lot of the projects we do now are international. And I can hear from colleagues, it's the same thing for them. So, you know, we work in, in the United States, in the Far East, in Southern Europe, in Sweden, which is very different from Denmark, culturally in many ways. And there are a lot of challenges understanding different cultures because you kind of, I think, subconsciously you're very driven by your own culture. It's so hard to step out of that culture and see, you know, other cultural values objectively. It's virtually impossible. And I can just see working as an architect, you really need to understand the need of your clients. I think it's super important for architects to understand that when they work for others, they're not building their own house. And sometimes a lot of architects, they have the tendency of just doing their thing and then kind of just exporting that idea. Yeah. And I definitely see it as a challenge, really deeply, profoundly understanding the need of people in totally different cultures, because there are just things that you, you haven't learned about that you maybe don't understand that are talked about or understood completely differently from what you're used to. So I think in that respect, that's a big challenge. And then another thing that's caused also by globalization and kind of social media is that a lot of people, they tend to do the same things because they're inspired by the 
the same things. So I think a good advice is that you should kind of stop getting inspiration from social media, which a lot of creatives do. And I think that you can actually see today that architecture is getting increasingly visual driven. I mean, so many architects, they focus on how things will look in images and not how they would work in reality. So that's kind of a problem there. It seems in many ways that, you know, all our other senses, even though the visual senses are most important to human beings, they're kind of forgotten because people are so focused on Instagrammable moments in creating architecture and maybe to a lesser extent about kind of the haptic, tactile qualities of uh, of their buildings or interiors or products they're they're creating and that seemed to be a challenge that is hard to escape because you're kind of you're in this digital world that is more or less only about the visual aspect of uh, human life and that's definitely a challenge for most of us creatives the dream is to make a living by pursuing our passion that can be challenging both when we are just starting, but sometimes even well off in our careers. And it can mean that to make it work, we need to change our strategy, marketing, or diversify our offering. I've talked to Jonas about how they tackle those financial challenges at Norm Architects. Our business is in many ways divided in two different ways of running a business. One is doing product design, which is royalty-based work. So that's much like being an author or a musician. You kind of create a work or a piece and then you kind of uh, set it free into the world. And then kind of the financial gain depends very much on how successful the product is in the world. And it's all about taking chances and risk. And you often do that together with a company that kind of distribute and sell and produce the things that, that you create. And I think starting out, it's very difficult to make a living from being a product designer because you need to have so many products out there to actually, you know, be able to make a living from it because you only get like two or three or five or maximum 10% of of the sales, depending on what type of product you've made or what business you're dealing with or how good a contract you made with the ones paying you royalty. So I think when we started out 10 years ago, for the first, I think maybe five years, we didn't make any money, but we got a lot of products into production with different companies. So we could see there was kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And I experienced because I work with so many young designers when I'm curating design for, for example, menu that they need to have kind of other jobs to be able to do what they, they like designing products or they need to take consultancy jobs or they need to be employed somewhere and then kind of work on the products in their free time, which is a big challenge because it really needs kind of your full attention and, yeah. and it takes a lot of time to, to do that. So I think it took us around five years to be able to to make a living of designing products. Okay. But now, on the other hand, you know, they keep selling because we've made it a, a virtue focusing on kind of, so let's say, very timeless, simple products that can hopefully have a long life in the world. So they keep on selling. And then suddenly it's kind of, it's a passive income. I mean, I don't have to get up in the morning and go to work to earn money. That comes from the sales of all the products that are kind of independent of, uh, of my involvement which is very nice. It's just a very long path and it's a big yeah. investment uh, yeah. Yeah. to make. And then on the other side, we have the architecture business, which is basically a consultancy mm -hmm. business. So it's about selling your time. And I think the big challenge there is that people, they're really not that willing to pay for a bright idea because it's so <laughs> airy. Yeah. I mean, uh, even though it, it's often the most important part of, of architecture, that's the idea, you know, or the ideas or how to structure it. It's all mind work, but people, they don't really value it, you know? So it's, I think generally for creatives, it's hard to get paid for all the time and thoughts put into architectural work. But clients are, you know, more than willing to pay for technical drawings or yeah. engineer work or people hammering in nails in the building because that's very tangible. Yeah. So it's, you know, but it's also very generic. There are so many people that can do that, but there are so few people coming out with kind of extraordinary ideas. So I think kind of being paid enough 
for good ideas is super hard driving that that type of business. And I can say for our architecture firm, that's a relatively small firm and we do very selected projects where we try to do something that's very holistic, where we design everything from the building to the interior to the objects and bespoke pieces and kind of go all the way around. And we don't participate in big competitions and we don't do hospitals or cultural buildings or that type of work where, you know, where there's there are years of work of kind of generic architecture work that you can, can invoice. Then we need, really need to find the right clients to be able to, to have a good business from that part. And that's also why I think 80% of our work now is international because it's just uh, fewer people that are willing to build that type of architecture or do that type of interiors. But I know from colleagues in the business that also people running bigger architectural studios, they have the same problem. You know, they earn all their money on kind of technical architects or young junior architects and all the kind of work, brilliant work being put into to competition or actually designing the building. That's not where they make their money. So I guess like how you're trying to position yourself with kind of approaching it in a holistic way you're trying to probably is that like the way you're you're trying to get like more or portray more value to the client so you kind of can kind of package all that in i think for some clients of course it's very nice to have kind of a one-stop shopping that they don't have to be the project managers of a project that they need to deal with a a builder and an engineer and an architect and a product designer and, and put all of that together they can kind of come to one place that's kind of from a practical point of view from our point of view it's more about being able to kind of control the whole universe of what we are creating you know i've seen so many great buildings that you have before visiting them, they maybe I've only seen them in, in images and the fa- facade was so beautiful. But once I entered the buildings, maybe it was only kind of the, the public areas that were well designed, maybe the foyer or the entrance. And then the rest was just super standardized because it was actually the builder deciding on all the details and it was just kind of off the shelf yeah. details and doors, kitchens, interiors, floors, piping, everything was yeah. just kind of nothing really Uh, and i think that's super dissatisfying to architects because they had a vision about the quality of of their work and architecture is not only about the facade or the statement building in a big city it's just as much about how it's used and the quality of the interior most architecture is experienced by people from the inside out and, and not only from the the outside in and i think just you know from experience We really loathed the fact that we couldn't control all parts of the finished work. And we saw all the small details equally important to kind of the bigger gestures of of our projects. So that's really why we want to make projects where it's uh, holistic and, and we're involved in all parts of the process. I think that's very much about pursuing your dreams and not making too many compromises. Of course, you need to make compromises doing product design because you need to understand the need of people or the need of the market. You need to understand company you're working for, their values, uh, their views on design, looking at their existing portfolio. So it's all like a collaborative process in, in that way. But I think a lot of designers are pushed to make too many compromises. So I think, you know, really standing firm on the things that you know will work because you've spent a whole lifetime kind of refining and giving thought to product design. I think you need to to make fewer compromises. I think that will be a good investment, uh, kind of looking at it for the long term and not so much for kind of like a a short-term gain so it's better kind of declining a product that you're not proud of instead of kind of accepting it just for to make brief living and in the end it also turns out to be a a better investment in and it it feeds new work on a higher level instead of the opposite uh, which is that it'll get worse and worse hey friends you're listening to the creative voyage podcast we are roughly in the middle of this episode so it's time for a short break there's no team behind this show It's solely produced and edited by me, Mario. I don't have any sponsors, and I have no plans to add any. Nevertheless, I can use all the help I can get growing the show. If you like what you've heard so far, there's three simple things you can do for me and future episodes. Number one, review the show on Apple Podcasts. Number two, tell a friend and share a link on social media. And number three, visit the shop on creative.voyage slash shop and support the show by buying bespoke Creative Voyage products. Thanks, everyone. Let's get back to the show. (laughs) 
As creatives, in many ways, we are performing what Seth Godin would call emotional labor and define as the work of doing what we don't necessarily feel like doing, the work of being a professional, the work of engaging with others in a way that leads to the best long-term outcome. That could be taxing, so it's important to nurture our spirit and invest in ourselves. I've asked Jonas how he approaches that. I think that a lot of good investments I've made in myself. I think generally I don't think so much about, you know, the goal or the gain. I think more about whether I would enjoy something. And, and often when I start out projects, I mean, I don't talk about what should be the gain or the price of things. And I often also do things for free if, if I just feel that this could be good. And it always turns out that it's a good investment also financially eh, somehow. So I think sometimes being more focused on really making good things instead of that's a general good investment. And then, I mean, there are so many investments you can make for yourself in terms of taking breaks or uh, traveling or uh, focusing on sport or getting away from work for a while, kind of a, on a more personal uh, level. I think are super important. As I said before, you know, if I work very intensively for a period, I really need to invest in myself physically and time-wise and relax for a while and take a longer break. We often also take our work to other places. We do what we call kind of like pop-up studios. So it's not that long, but for a month or so, we move to some other country to work. And it's both kind of getting away from all the daily routines. That's one thing. Another thing, getting away from... The gray cold weather in February in Denmark, <laughs> uh, which is uh, super important as well. Uh, kind of it re-energizes you in many ways. And then I've experienced that when we go abroad, you always meet new people, you create a new network, yeah, you get new ideas. And I think for you to create something new, if something new should come out of you, you need to have something new to come in. So yeah. it's all about the importance of inspiration. I don't think you can sit in, in your office and have the same stroll or the same commute to work every day and then keep on being creative. I think you need to experience new things in order to kind of evolve all the time, yeah. uh, both as a person, as a creative. Yeah. So how often do you do those like pop-up studios? Do you like actually take the whole team or most of the team? How do you? We did it more when we are fewer people now. It's uh, the office has grown and it's harder to, to do the whole team. Uh, but at least once a year, I kind of need to get away, get new inspiration. And yeah. then I often combine work with maybe doing photography work for a magazine. So if I come to some place I have never been before, maybe I do a, a design and architecture guide. And that's a good way to kind of get around to know the place and meet new people. And it's not that we often, you know, have a project there, but then a project kind of comes from the travel itself. I think in that way, it's a really good investment getting out. Growth is certainly one of the reoccurring themes in this series. That's because I believe it's one of the determining factors for our fulfillment. But to grow, we have to challenge ourselves and in some ways embrace uncertainty, which can be hard. I wanted to hear how Jonas is making sure that besides working on client assignments, he also develops as a creative professional. It's a super complex question. I often think about it and I speak with friends about it because on one hand, I think kind of being ignorant is blessed in many ways. I mean, we had a small house in Italy that I bought with some friends when we just came out of high school as a fun project. And it was a small town on a hillside in the middle of Italy. And there were people that had lived their whole life on that mountainside. And they were so proud, you know, of their food, of their town, of the country around them. And the wine was the best in the world. And, you know, their soccer team was the best in the world. And everything was, uh, they were really so proud. They had never been away. Maybe they had been to Rome one time in their life. But they were so happy and, and content that I thought, you know, that can be a really good way of leading your life. But once you start to get out and you start to experience all the world offers, it's kind of like opening Pandora's box in many ways. You want more all the time and you can't really be satisfied just staying in the same place, doing the same things over and over again. But I'm kind of caught in between those things, I think. Of course, I really need to evolve as a person and as a creative. And, and when I look at people that had kind of 10 years where they were really good and then kind of just faded in, into nothingness, I often wonder, you know, can you keep on staying sharp? Can you keep on evolving new ideas? Or do you kind of freeze and get stuck at, at a certain point? But I think the thing I started out talking about with collaborating with people all around the world and with the younger generation and all of that 
will kind of put you in a position where people keep on challenging your ideas. And I think that's a good way to evolve. I think for the creatives that are very close about their processes, they can often kind of repeat themselves endlessly. For some, it can be good because it, their work can become very refined. For others, they can kind of get stuck in repetition and, and never kind of move on. And I'm very conscious about kind of getting out there, opening up my ideas, let people challenge them. And then keep on thriving on certainty in many ways. I think it's uncertainty that also leads you to excel because you kind of keep on refining your choices, evolving. Once if you get too satisfied or too settled or too proud, then maybe you can kind of lose your ability to, to really evolve. Yeah. And do you have any specific resources or like routines or like stuff which like just like help you with that? Either because it does seem that your mindset is, is in a good place regarding that. You're kind of like exposing yourself and you're, it seems that it's, it's working at least like currently. So was there like something that kind of like helped you with that or how do you? I think maybe it's kind of like a, a general feel of uncertainty whether things uh, are good enough. And I think early on I didn't value it that much. I thought more it was a weakness more than a strength. But now I see that, that maybe it is a strength that you kind of, that you all the time ask people for input, opinions, then you do refinements. And once you're not afraid of the uncertainty, then it's also easier to kind of jump off the bridge and do things where you maybe think starting out the process that, that you're not fit for this job or it kind of that you don't have the abilities. But it's often in kind of in those moments hanging in the air before you hit the water that you evolve the most and that you really kind of learn new things and evolve both as a person. And that can happen in so many situations. I mean, it can be both working with a creative that's much more experienced than you, but it can definitely also be working with somebody that's completely young and inexperienced and just see things very differently. And that's just undertaking kind of new technical challenges as well. I yeah. mean, that was how I started photographing. I knew nothing about photography, but I loved images. And then I just kind of accepted jobs <laughs> and uh, I didn't really know how a camera worked at all <laughs> and uh, I think some of the first photography work I, that I handed in for a magazine it was really awful and uh, really you know poorly retouched and then I got kind of criticism and then I had to go back and work even harder for it and try to hand it in again and so I think there's like all of us there's been a lot of failures leading to success but kind of thriving on that uncertainty I think is a good way to keep you on your toes and refining your work and then of course hard work putting in a lot of hours kind of being more skilled yeah but it does seem to like if you want to like learn almost anything you kind of have to be fine with just like being bad at it yeah and that can be like very painful because it's just like you know that it's bad yeah but the only way to become better is to be doing bad stuff in a way yeah i have friends that are creatives that maybe like you they play music and but they won't let anybody listen to it so you know they say i do this for myself and all of that but they're not open to get actually criticism and i think that can be a way where you can kind of go through a whole life with a dream where you actually never really improved because you didn't dare to hear the hard truth about your work so yeah. again it's about putting things out there and getting the responses and yeah. then you know improve yeah and then yeah trying to in a way detach yourself from the result or like from learning that criticism is not about people criticizing you as a person it's about people giving their opinion about the work and you know that can always be remade or made better the next time or yeah so you shouldn't take it as a, a negative thing i've always really appreciated very critical dialogues and i know also in my studio sometimes i'm very candid about what i think about the work being done in the studio and it's not to be hard or to be judgmental or say ugly thing about things about you know, the work of my colleagues or collaborators. It's more about kind of driving the process forward. So it's only about the work. It's never about the person and that can easily be misunderstood. But I think once people learn that it's a positive thing and not a negative thing, then they actually appreciate being pushed. I remember from my years in the art academy, some of the professors that I today value the most are definitely the ones that were most critical about my work because I can really see now how much they pushed me in the right direction. Whereas the ones that gave me kind of positive feedback, they haven't had that much of importance looking back. Do you have any, let's say, tactic or like technique when you're giving critical feedback, like to make sure that people 
like actually hear it in a way that it's like intended because it is great once people learn how to relate to it and get that like mindset and build that muscle and then it's like okay they can process that information and then it's like okay it's not about me or maybe they feel it like for a second but then they kind of bypass that but often people struggle with managing that so do have you like maybe found like ways of <laughs> it's so hard to say yourself because it should be other people's opinion about that but i kind of sense that i'm not the best person at, at being diplomatic i try sometimes to do it but then i often feel that it's not heard right that you no know, i think generally humans minds are designed in a way that you know you try to make the best sense for yourself on what you hear so you kind of try to structure the world in your head in a way that it comes out in the most positive way for yourself and i think sometimes when i try to be critical in a very diplomatic way people they just take it as positive feedback and they don't really change the things that needs to be changed in a project so i feel that the best and most direct way to kind of push people in the right direction and evolve them it's not about giving them answers it's more about questioning certain choices in a project and it's always up for discussion and then I'm, I'm often wrong about things so it's not, it's not like a yeah but i like to have the critical debate about it but i, I think i come on too strong for many people and then uh, it becomes very direct they see it as hard criticism and th the only way i've kind of found a way to go about it is to try to be a little bit humoristic about it oh, okay so talk about it in metaphors that uh, that seem a little more lightheaded and, and not too serious yeah and then you can have a great laugh about it instead but you still kind of get the point that this needs to be reworked yeah in some way sometimes that works but uh, yeah and my professional partner casper that has dealt with me for like 15 years uh, how much is it, it is now he always kind of just laughs about it so he <laughs> used to it in, in many ways but uh, it's something i need to work on Norm Architect's portfolio has an enviable selection of clients and collaborators, and each new project they put out seems to be on point and in some way pushes them forward. It seems that as a creative studio, they've done a great job at positioning themselves to attract the right clients and to do the work that's relevant and inspiring. I've asked Jonas about how they've achieved that. I think it's been kind of like a very long process in many ways. I think for the first years, we really had to work extremely hard to get very few results because it was not so much about just our abilities as architects or designers. It was a lot to do with the structures around us, you know, working for the right company, working for the right clients that were willing to do the same things as you wanted to do or that had financial capabilities to actually make certain dreams come true both for them and and for us creatively and and to begin with that was just not the case you know we didn't start with the coolest design company in the world and we didn't start out with the richest client that you know could make whatever it was kind of like fake it until you make it strategy i think we just did small projects so to begin with it was for clients in the neighborhood and friends and family and kind of connections you had around and the first design company that approached us that was the one we started working for so it wasn't that conscious it was more about what was possible to begin with and then as i said before it was very much about early on choosing the right projects so you know there were projects we made to begin with just to make a living that we didn't publish or and then the things that we felt turned out pretty good you know we started publishing them and i think had we been a company design architecture company 20 30 years ago we wouldn't have had the same success as today because i think we early on were very skilled at kind of telling about our work communicating about our work so we put a lot of effort into kind of telling people about our ideas behind what we did and we made a lot of images and we made sure that it that it came into the world and with all the possibilities you have of communicating today if you can make great content you don't need a lot of money to kind of advertise it it, it all happens automatically and then it reaches kindred spirits in different places and they approach you and then kind of all the projects they grow in in the right direction but it's definitely been a hard and long process getting to that point where we are today where we are very privileged and The work we're able to do has very much to do with all the partners that we do it with. So it's it not kind of uh, something 
that we can decide on ourselves. And that, I mean, there are architects or designers that just find the right partner from early on and they're able to fulfill their dreams much faster. And for us, it was quite a long, long journey getting there. And as I said before, we also had times where we started doing projects that we didn't feel were in the right direction. And then was kind of not showcasing them, but just choosing other projects yeah. and kind of in the presentation of your company, kind of clean up all the time, making sure you don't have old projects that you're not proud of anymore. And then kind of, then automatically it goes in the right direction. But it's interesting now, 10 years after we started that now we can do much better projects, much higher quality, much better details and put much less work into it. But that's kind of the odd thing about how it evolves, but it's very privileged. At this point in our conversation, I wanted to hear if there's anything that Jonas is currently struggling with. I think there are many things. We've already touched a little bit about on balance, finding the right balance all the time and maybe accepting that you have intense periods and relaxed periods instead of kind of finding the right balance through your whole life. And that's often something I struggle with. And, you know, the more successful you are, the more opportunities you have, and the more you also have to say no to people that you really like or projects that seem interesting. And that's a hard thing that I struggle with all the time. I say yes too much. And the one ending up paying the bill is, is me in many ways, because you just get overloaded at times. Yeah. So I need to remind myself also that even though it's a great opportunity, maybe it's just not the right timing for me. That's definitely one thing. Then another thing I've given a lot of thought lately is kind of how to choose new challenges that keeps your work interesting. I mean, if you designed, let's say, five chairs, is it interesting to keep on designing new chairs or have you done two or three houses should you move on and try actually to do a competition for a bigger building or kind of what could be the next step once you kind of fulfilled all the obvious dreams what's next is is or should you change career completely i mean i did it like five six years ago when i had worked a lot as a product designer and an architect then i had the fascination with photography and, and kind of always dreamt about life of a photographer being in the studio traveling doing shoots working with images that i really like a lot because i, I love that there yeah. Love that process. And then slowly I just, you know, started seeking opportunities that in, involve photography. And for the recent four or five months, I've been doing a lot of photography. And I've kind of, for many years, reserved that as a, a creative free space where I, I didn't want to be pushed on making a living from that. I think once you get into a, a structure with a company where you need to also consider making a living or paying salaries to people, then maybe you need to accept sometimes jobs where you compromise too much just to keep the studio running. And with photography, I kind of decided for myself, I wanted to keep that as a free space. So for me, it's never been about making a living or, or money. It's just been about making great Im images. But now I've kind of been sucked a little bit into also doing more commercial photography and I'm traveling all the time photographing great places and great spaces and all of that. But how do I make sure that I don't end up doing it so much that I eventually hate doing what I love the most right now? So that's also kind of a challenge. I have a, a very close friend that's always been a fashion photographer and I never understood why he didn't take any images on his free time, you know, with the family or traveling and But now that I've done so much, I can kind of understand where he comes from, that you do it so much that if you're on vacation or with your family, maybe that's not what you want. And for me, it's kind of always been a, an integral part of myself, kind of photographing, learning about the world, you know, focusing uh, with your lens on details and kind of breaking the whole experience of the world down to parts that you can really understand. So I couldn't not do it, but I'm kind of reaching that point where I, Maybe I need to take a little bit of a break from that to, to make sure that it's, it's not too much and then kind of maybe turn my attention to something else. Do you have anything that you're kind of like toying with? Actually, I've always loved writing, but I've never kind of done that. So maybe that should be kind of a new creative venture at some point. But I know it's, uh, you know, and it's another 10 years kind of uh, <laughs> putting hard work into. Yeah. But yeah, that could be interesting. Yeah, definitely at some point. As Jonas's biography on Norm Architect's website suggests, 
He shares a passion for phenomenology, the philosophical study of human experience, which I found intriguing, so I've asked him to expand on that. I've studied a lot in architecture school, actually. I took kind of six months where I wrote a small book trying to examine kind of the bridge between architecture and philosophy. And I tried to develop like 10 different terms for talking about architecture as the body experiences architecture. So not only considering kind of what can be measured or quantified or how you see things, but actually how you have a kind of a bodily experience of architecture. I think everybody, if they go back in childhood, they can kind of recall the summer house of their grandparents and kind of mentally walk around it. They can look at the different things in their mind and kind of they can taste how all the furniture tastes in the walls because as children we all kind of used our mouth as a sensory way of perceiving the world so i mean you can look at a brick wall and you know how it will taste just by looking at it so it's kind of how can you create architecture that kind of uh, cares about all those bodily experiences uh, so it's considering also how things feel and how they smell and how they taste and how they sound and, you know, the perception of scale relates, related to your own body. German philosopher Walter Benjamin has made a great essay about his childhood in Berlin that actually in many ways tells about this way of, of experience, experiencing the world and experiences in architecture. And how can you kind of create ways of working with that so you're much more conscious about that bodily experience of, of built environments. I think that's very important, especially as I talked about before in this time where everything becomes so visually driven. That's how we try to approach it in architecture. In product design, it's very much about anthropomorphism, anthropos coming from Greek meaning human and morphe meaning shape. So the human shape in man-made objects. And I think it's because we understand the world from our own perspective so we kind of read human characteristics or abilities into everything we see to make sense of it so if you talk about let's say a water carafe you can say it's feminine or masculine something that relates to yeah. to human gender you can talk about something being kind of very cute they have in japan kawaii as a, an essential part of their aesthetic culture and it's because in many ways it relates to babies or children or that type of uh, proportion in, in things. And I think biologically, we have our brains programmed to kind of nurture and take care and feel, have generous feelings towards objects that are cute or kawaii or children-like. And if we talk about, let's say, a design family of carafes and glasses, we talk about the concept of family, which also relates again to human nature animals, uh, but we read it into dead objects. Yeah. And we do that all the time. And I think working with these principles in terms of understanding proportions and how to soften up geometry, which is kind of an artificial thing in our world and make things more anthropomorphic or biomorphic, it uh, kind of uh, it relates to, to nature, which I think is something that appealed to all humans, regardless of cultural preferences. And it's the same thing, I think, in architecture, we work a lot with natural materials, or bringing in nature to our built environments. And that can be both very literally speaking, that we use stone, wood, chalk, clay, uh, concrete, kind of natural materials that makes you relate to nature in many ways, instead of painted surfaces and plastic surfaces and shiny glass surfaces and things that are, are more alien to us. I think there's kind of a longing, especially in this time of urbanization and digitalization, of bringing nature back. And we can work with it in, the, in, in this very little way, but also in a more symbolic way where you can kind of imitate nature in your build structures or your products in the way they're shaped and kind of bring that closer to your natural human bodily experience of architecture and design.
So if somebody would like to explore that more, like, do you have any resources, like starting points, either like books or certain authors or certain like movements to look at? There's a Finnish architecture professor, Joani Palasma, if I don't know if it's uh, pronounced correctly, but that's written uh, a number of really good books on the subjects, both his kind of own considerations and also uh, bringing in thinkers from around the world that has explored this approach to architecture and specifically, which are, uh, are really interesting books. So I think that he's definitely a, a good starting point in many ways. In most cases, we can develop our skills without practicing those skills, and we can become good at something before we are quite bad at it. So that learning process involves vulnerability and inevitable setbacks. I asked Jonas to share his thoughts on that and the failures he experienced on his professional journey. I definitely made many mistakes within all the creative disciplines where I've worked. You know, I've designed products that have been mass produced in thousands of copies that were really awful and didn't fulfill any needs in the market for anybody. And it was just a kind of pure waste. And once you've done that a couple of times, you get more and more aware of, you know, the responsibility you actually have putting new objects into the world. I remember I was in a panel discussion with design manager of IKEA. And we talked about this topic and he said that in IKEA, not only are they, you know, making not thousands, but millions of copies uh, and pushing them into the market worldwide. But for each new product that they decide should go into their collection They're also building a factory and maybe employing a whole small village or a city. So they really have a social responsibility doing that. I, I think I've become more and more aware of that, you know, once you've done a, a few mistakes in that direction. And I think it's been super important to learn those lessons. I think to begin with, I was just so focused on actually, you know, making an object and seeing it come to life and seeing it being in, in people's homes and hopefully you know you made a difference with it but uh, or fulfilled the need but then once you see a lot of objects that don't really make sense and i hope i'm i'm getting more and more aware of the things you actually put into the market that you know they should make sense and i think for example within photography as we talked about before it was definitely all the bad pictures that i naively sent to editors and uh, design companies where I got a hard feedback. That was where I, I really, you know, evolved and kind of took myself to a new new level. I think it's in many ways, all those mistakes were the ones that, that pushed me the most. Yeah. And how, like in those situations, when you have, when you realize like a certain mistake or, or you experienced a certain failure, how do you manage that? And has that like maybe changed? I assume probably it has over over years and as you mature as a creator it probably yeah. becomes easier but it definitely becomes easier because you just realize it's a part of life and that's how it is and you make them all the time yeah but it's always kind of like a, a hard blow but of course the first times you experience it was really devastating in many ways but i've always had the ability to go into war mode and then i really need to kind of uh, okay so that's <laughs> show uh, uh, you know what i can actually do and you know just get all the help i can kind of get back up on the horse and really try your, your best to move to the next level so i think my response have never been kind of being depressed or it's kind of been the opposite it's kind of given me a lot of energy and invigorated me in many ways. And has that just come like naturally? Maybe it's a part of your character? Yes, probably. I think it's always been like that. If I really wanted to be good at something, whether it was creatively or personally or at sports, you know, I just focused on that one thing and just put a lot of hours into it. I think maybe it was five, six years ago, I had been practicing tennis for a year and I thought I'd become fairly good. And then I had an old friend that I knew had been kind of an elite player here in, in Denmark in tennis. So I invited him up to the tennis court close to my home and he came up there on his bike with his uh, girlfriend. And then we started out playing and he said, well, you play fairly good. And then he beat me, you know, 6-0, 6-0. I was just <laughs> running around. Uh, <laughs> and then I kind of, after that time, I decided that Now I really wanted to put all my energy into being that good a tennis player that I could beat him. That was kind of the goal. And was it kind of two weeks ago? I played him again since that time for the first time and I beat him and it was, oh, uh, wow. uh, <laughs> but it's taking a lot of uh, hours of uh, playing tennis as an adult where you kind of, uh, you're a slow learner uh, yeah. compared to, to young children and uh, a lot of private uh, lessons with uh, different trainers on vacations and, and back home and a lot of hours just going down to the court by yourself and 
playing with the machine or serving or but it's yeah i i that's kind of that battle war mentality <laughs> uh, yeah, that kind of uh, can also take you to the next level yeah wow when you're just like chipping away for like years yeah, and getting yeah. ready yeah. it's always for the always for the long run <laughs> yeah that's impressive but it's a good mindset because with most of, of those of these like things even like uh -huh. work like creatively is actually that long run and yeah, you can never do it kind of like super quick and yeah. if people think they can do that they often give up yeah And then I think it's also about saying it out loud. So I said it out loud. That kind of uh, ah, so you, if you say you it to enough uh, people, then you kind of it's out there. You already kind of promised. Uh, so you need to kind of work hard for it. Yeah, yeah. So I think kind of putting your dreams out there, telling friends and family and colleagues and people openly about it. Also, even though it seems to be utopian ideas or dreams, I think it's a it's a good way to drive you. Yeah, yeah. You put yourself on a right yeah, spot. I mean, you exactly. Make, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, otherwise it's like easy to hide. You can always be like, yeah, then, yeah. oh, it's. Then you have so many dreams that never become anything other than dreams. Jonas is involved in a remarkable variety of creative work, but somehow manages to retain a particular feel through all these different outlets he explores. I was curious to hear how he approaches new projects and succeeds to keep that continuity throughout most of what he's doing. It's just as varied as my work week is very different. And sometimes it's very structured, strategic in the approach to, to a project. Of course, it differs very much, whether it's architecture or design or photography, because there are different processes and different techniques involved and different amounts of clients and things you need to consider. But also within each field, it, it varies a lot from project to project, from client to client, but also just depending on you know how the kind of the first idea occurs what ignites the project you know sometimes it can come from a conversation with somebody that suddenly there's an idea it could be you know anything about culture or processes or needs or other times it can be a visit to a factory and you see a manufacturing process that's super interesting you don't know what you want to use it for but you kind of you want to investigate it further and that becomes a project other times it can be a very specific brief from a client that's very well structured other times it can just be a collaboration starting off with kind of zero structure and then you just kind of play around with ideas i think sometimes it's very intuitive and other times it's uh, it's very conscious and i think in terms of inspiration we get it from so many different sources so it can be about well, taking a walk in nature and being fascinated with the uh, structures in in nature that's often a good way to get inspiration but it can also be as banal as seeing another piece of architecture and then you think oh i could use this principle in in my work as well or maybe you just see a small improvement and you see it as an evolution or it can be just about creating hybrids all ideas comes from something so it can be just you know putting two ideas together in a new way that creates something that's slightly different from what exists already and then other times with the architecture it can be kind of the same thing you do over and over again but refine it more and more from project to project mm -hmm. so it's working with something that's very familiar very, very well known and You just, you have the feel to, or the need to keep on investigating. So I think the processes and how they're structured and how they come to life are extremely different for me. It's uh, Yeah. So it seems then the process is quite varied and the types of projects that you're working on are quite varied, but it does seem that you, in the output of, of all these different projects and work, there is like a certain like theme feel to it yeah. i wouldn't like say style maybe that's not the best how do you see that i'm glad you say that and i hear it quite often that it seems like this coherence or connection from our photography through our products to our architecture i wouldn't say it's a conscious thing but i think it's the output of kind of working with one's passion and i certainly like all other people have a, a certain perspective on on the world and what i see as uh, useful or what i see as beautiful and i think that in many ways shine through all the different things so i think there's definitely a, an aesthetic approach to all the different disciplines where it's for us very much about focusing on the essence of things so i think in all our creative processes i always have this game of balance where i try to take away things until they lose all character and then i put an element back and then it's just on the right tipping point where on one hand it's so simple 
uh, so natural feeling that it uh, it becomes timeless. I mean, it could be made now, it could be made a thousand years ago, or it can hopefully seem like something that would be made in 20 years. I mean, it, it has that feeling to it. On the other hand, it needs to have enough character to stand out as something special or recognizable. And kind of that the game of balance is something I also take into architecture and into photography. If I frame a photo, how much can I take away when I frame the photo to focus on that thing that I feel is essential that I want people to look at and focus on? How strong can I make that image if there is too much clutter around and too many other things where the eye can kind of wander, then I don't make a statement about that one thing that I want to tell about in in my photography. And in in architecture, again, it's about how clean and simple can I make the house so it becomes like a really timeless piece that is not bound to a certain period in time, but at the same time, make it so cozy and natural feeling and a place that works well for by human life unfolding. How can I find that balance? And I think maybe it's that principle that you can see in the the output of our work that connects all the different disciplines. We've come to the very end of the conversation I had with Jonas. I aim to wrap up every episode with closing takeaways for my guests. Here's what Jonas shared with me. One good advice would definitely be not to be afraid to expose yourself. I mean, I think a lot of people, and that's also something I dealt with, especially in my younger years, it's vanity in many ways. And I mean, that you're afraid to expose yourself because you're afraid of failure. And I really think a good advice, if you can kind of forget about vanity and and just expose yourself, put your ideas out there, uh, take the criticism as a positive way of evolving as a creative professional and as a as a person, that would be a, a super good advice. I would have loved to have known that much early on in in life. And then I think uh, maybe banal advice, but kind of make all your choices based on passion and something that feels like a vocation. Don't be too strategic about the choices you make as a creative professional in life. And don't think too much about the end goal, but focus more on the process and how that will evolve you as a person. So kind of don't ever see it as a, a path to reaching something special, but just make sure that you really enjoy uh, waking up every day and starting your daily life with work or whatever you do. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I did making it. I believe we touched on a lot of useful information for anybody out there interested in architecture, design and development as creative professional. I want to thank Jonas for coming onto the show. I find his work, approach, and enthusiasm inspiring, and I'm grateful for the insights he shared with me. Links to Jonas' work, as well as to some other things mentioned during our conversation, can be found in the show notes at creative.voyage slash podcast. As I've already mentioned, this is the last episode of Season 1 of the podcast. After two months and 12 episodes in, I'm thankful and humbled by the support and feedback I've received. Holidays are ahead, so I'll be taking a short break before starting with work on Season 2. I welcome all your suggestions, just hit me up. You can follow at Creative Voyage on Instagram, and you can also join my email list by sending me a note on hello at creative.voyage. It's the best way to keep in touch while I'm preparing the second season and other exciting initiatives coming in 2019. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, and until next time my friends, take care!